going a little bit of ice keeping. We don't have any fire alarm. Uh, we are going, um, if you can um, leave your video off and uh, microphone off during the presentation, we are going to have um, a QA and a session towards the end of each presentation. Uh, please uh, put your question in the Q&A &A that you got. So you should have it uh, on the bottom of your screen. And we are going to read the question uh, uh, from there. At the end of this session, we, we will have uh, another Q&A session when you will be asked to switch on the video to make it more dynamic. So today we are going to present on the project um, and we have uh, the first section will be on uh, the, the background and the foundation study that we had uh, on, uh, on the demand project. And we are going to talk about uh, the, the framework that we have created for the, for the agent-based modeling at large scale. And then we will focus on the attitudes of people towards shared mobility. And now we included the cost uh, towards shared mobility into the agent-based modeling. Then we will conclude with the validation of the model and the potential applications that we, we might have with this type of urban demonstrator. And at the, at the end, as I say, we're going to have um, a Q&A session moderated by Nina Sari uh, and me. And hopefully we are going to be on time. So first presenter on the day is the DFT lead on, uh, on the project, Nila Sari and she will present on the background of the project. Nila, the floor, which floor is yours? <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar. I cannot see you, but I can see some names. Um, so yeah, it's a bit uh, funny sometimes talking uh, to the screen. Uh, my name is Nila Sari, and I am a transport modeler from the Department for Transport. As Patricia said in this webinar, Connected Places Catapult are going to present their work in developing an activity-based model. Um, and uh, the project is called DEMAND, stands for Demand Modeling and Assessment through a Network Demonstrator. So this project started in early 2019. With uh, So it took them about a year to finish. The main aim of uh, the project was to build a prototype agent-based model with activity-based approach. About a year before this project started, we did pl pl uh, initial work when we put forward the business case for the development of new modeling tool to assess demand for new mobility services. Just like to mention that the work was funded by us, the DFT, under the DFT and CPC Collaborative Research Programme. From um, our perspective uh, within the DFT, uh, particularly with the introduction of new transport uh, mode and schemes, as well as new technology that are coming in, we would like to explore new, new modeling methodology that may be more suitable for assessing these uh, type of new schemes. So in this slide, as a background, uh, the initial work we did in 2018, as well as Catapult's previous work in developing agent-based models for assessing new mobility services. Um, we identified the process required from technology-driven market to data-driven solution. Um, we looked at challenges in implementing new mobility services, such as the need to understand demand, um, the impact on other modes, and the need for appropriate modeling tool. With new schemes such as uh, mobility as a service, there is a need for an appropriate tool to assess demand and um, optimize the schemes before introdu introducing them into the market. In particular, we need to ensure um, they integrate well with um, existing public transport and attract the right kind of demand. The existing traditional four-stage transport modeling that we all know may not be sufficient to do this kind of analysis. So we'd like to think of a new way of modeling demand and um, assessing this new type of schemes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, 
so during the work, we identified the requirements for developing a large scale demonstrator to accelerate the adoption of um, this new methodology for assessing demand for emerging mobility. Uh, we identified that we would require an agent based modeling with activity based approach. Why? Because this type of model is able to represent the end to end users journeys and uh, allowing for multimodal interaction. And this type of model can also be used to assess ride sharing um, services uh, using either conventional or autonomous vehicles. Um, and the next important aspect is the requirement of very rich, um, large data ecosystem that comes from new generation of big data sets, such as mobile, mobile network data. And uh, its integration with traditional data set, for example, census data. Um, at the early stage of utilizing this new type of me methodology, we need to be able to integrate this new method with our existing traditional four-stage trans transport models. Um, the methodology developed by Catapult in this project needs to be transferable so others can develop similar models for other applications. Um, so the development of uh, an activity-based model is not strictly new, but in this country, I think we are all about to get to know it better. And we are keen on seeing more practical implementation of this method. And perhaps eventually it may become a known method in the future for the appraisal of new transport schemes. So I. Uh, now I'm going to hand this over to Patricia, who will discuss the demand project in detail. Thanks, Neela. So the demand modeling and assessment run network demonstrator, it was developed in the, in the last uh, year, like Neela said. Uh, the project is looking at developing a regional prototype. This is because uh, We've noticed in the past, building agent-based modeling, considering the travel patterns in an area, urban areas are never isolated, and you should consider the, how people move around, also in the, in the surrounding areas. Um, and most of the time, that means creating a regional demonstrator in order to have a urban demonstrator itself. Um, the main uh, uh, characteristics of this model is being able to represent the contribution that private on-demand transport has got so, on a multimodal public transport network. Um, the demonstrator is based in the Northeast um, purely because there is a strong attitude towards public transport there. Uh, they got a higher bus patronage in the entire North. They got a very good underground service, uh, uh, pervasive bus network, uh, and they got the lowest car ownership uh, that we got in the UK. So the, their attitudes to, towards innovative schemes uh, and public transport is pretty much open. Uh, the agent-based model is an activity as an activity-based approach to understand why people move around and what type of mode of transport they prefer at the moment. And we, reach, we use a data-rich approach to the transport planning. So we use highly special and, um, and temporal uh, anonymized and aggregated mobile network data to understand the travel patterns that they currently have. But also, we wanted to understand the latent demand and what will be their attitudes towards the introduction of, of uh, shared mobility services or a demand responsive transport. The framework itself for the agent based model is very similar to what a four step model is. So we created, we concentrate on the creation of the transport infrastructure, the synthetic population, and the mobility services. The transport infrastructure. And what we include is pretty similar to what we do in strategic modeling. So we've got a road network, rail network, and we've got a facilities including educational settings, leisure settings, uh, uh, shopping centers, business parks, and distribution centers, alongside the vehicle fleets that we currently used uh, in the Northeast. We had a validation of the network and everything was important in the Maxim platform. Maxim is a very versatile tool, allows you to embed your own feature into the model. Um, and these are software that has been developed from ETH Zuri for the past uh, 15 to 20 years. So it's quite stable, it's open software. So 
we had the possibility to tailor the, the platform according to our specification. The real innovation in demand is the way we built the synthetic population. Our agents are built through uh, highly granular uh, mobile network data, um, and especially the daily travel patterns uh, that you, you can have is different from what you currently have on agent-based modeling because we use strip chains data. So we know exactly how group of people move in uh, several zones and all the intermediate trips as well. Um, and then we generate the agents from mobile network data as well. And in order to understand the, tra the travel behavior and the attitudes towards shared mobility, we run a survey of the residents, a qualitative survey, and then a state preference survey. Uh, and we built behavioral models um, to, under ch to, to change the cost of shared mobility inside the model. Uh, because these costs are not the same of public transport and not the same of private cars. So that was um, a fundamental step for us. The daily travel patterns um, have been uh, obtained, developed, we developed uh, an open software, uh, a data exploratory framework to analyze the data and speed up the generation of the activity plans. And then we have public transport defined in the traditional way. We route them tables, vehicles, infrastructure, and share mobility can be represented using dynamic agents, either with a door-to-door -door service or a corner-to-corner -corner service as we already did during the model project um, in the past. So model coverage, even if a urban demonstrator is focusing on the time and wear, the model coverage stretch nationally because mobile network data are continuously connected. Um, and in order to understand, have a good understanding of all the travel patterns happening in the Northeast, we had to extend also the model, the model coverage. So we had an higher special granularity in the time and we are a lower super output area. If you're not familiar, this means um, 700, 800 households per zones. Um, the Northeast is a middle super output area, and then we got local authority district for the rest of England and uh, Wales and Scotland that comes as one zone. Um, we acquired two mobile network data sets, which is the traditional one, the origin destination matrix, accounting with almost uh, 1 million disconnected trips and the trip chain data sets, which is uh, um, uh, allow us to know the combination of different travel patterns, which is uh, around uh, almost 600,000 and allowed us uh, to generate 647,000 agents. Um, and this is uh, uh, acquired for an average weekday in March 2018. So we acquired four weeks of data, which created the average day across the six time periods. Most of the time when you want to activate a demand responsive transport service or a shared mobility, you can just look at the peaks, but you need to understand what is going on during the interpeaks. So we acquired data for AM peak and what we call interpeak one and interpeak two. Interpeak one is the interpeak in the morning and interpeak two is the interpeak that you got before four o'clock. Uh, and then you have uh, off peak one, so the early evening, and off peak two, which is the night time, uh, from ten o'clock till uh, seven uh, in the in the morning. And then we also acquire social demographic information from the mobile network data for age, gender, uh, and spending power as well. So as I say, the road infrastructure is all around the northeast and the bus services as well. Um, we got uh, a road infrastructure that has not been uh, simplified in any way. So both strategic and lo local roads have been maintained in order to uh, deploy the uh, demand responsive transport services uh, together with the multimodal public transport. The public transport network uh, is all the public transport network that is serving the North Sea. So, so national rail service actually stretch out for the entire England. So we can see here then we got uh, the line uh, towards uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, and we stretch uh, that's the east coast, and then we stretch till uh, Bristol and Southampton from this side. The bus timetable has been uh, the bus, uh, uh, the bus network and the rail network has been created using uh, open data source. Uh, we try to use uh, all the um, uh, openly available data for this. Uh, the Department for Transport allow us to use uh, uh, a great uh, tool, which is the Napton dataset, 
So we know all the bus stops and the train stations that we got um, in the UK. And we created a, a trunk exchange file and then converted everything in general transit uh, feed. So we will be able to use the PT2 mapping, which is a tool created by Francesco Ciari and Poletti. And we have been able to create uh, a, a one single um, public transport network in this way. And then we have the activity locations. So we know where the residential areas are, where the working areas are, leisure, education, business centers. And we created a vehicle uh, as well. So the most interesting part is the creation of the daily travel patterns. Um, the trip chains is fully anonymized and aggregated. So in order to retain the information of all the intermediate trips, we lose the information around the purpose of each trip and also mode of travel. So what we did is created a methodology to reassign purpose and mode of travel for each trip, looking at both origin destination matrix, but also land use, the time uh, where the trip occurred, how far they travel, and um, what type of facilities are available in the zones. Um, in doing this, we uh, first of all, we divided the sample in different subgroups. Uh, we obtaining uh, for um, homogeneous daily activity pa uh, patterns. And this is done uh, through high level uh, specification characteristics. So in this case, is number of trips uh, that every single individual got in one day. Uh, so we have from one, which is basically the either the outbound and the inbound or the internal trips, uh, which are not properly captured the short trips from mobile network data, till 21 trips in one day. Uh, we've been, we divided those in return and non-return trips. Non-return trips uh, are those that are, we can't say anything really, but some of them are actually local trips. So 20% of them, these are actually short trips uh, which uh, have been not uh, properly um, uh, marked by the mobile network data. Um, the data exploratory framework then creates the our daily uh, our daily plan table, which is done from uh, of 578 rows to 68 columns. And what we did is reassigning for each group for purpose and mode of transport. And in this way, you can uh, looking at origin destination matrix, so you can understand well where all my work is. And uh, thanks to the facilities and the, the type of travel patterns as well, we can understand different other uh, type of um, purpose of travel. So we created uh, um, uh, six, for six uh, activities. So home, work, leisure, education trips, but also we've been able to see the difference between local and long distribution of goods. So travel patterns, especially between the Tannenweir and the Cantidaram and Northumberland as well, we got these very high counter trips, which reveal a travel pattern of distribution of goods towards rural areas. So, so the 21 trips that we got, in fact, is somebody distributing goods towards the, uh, the Northumberland area. When um, we generated the agent based model, we compared also the performance of mobile network data and census data as well. The mobile network data, the social demographic information come from um, pay monthly uh, contracts. So there may be a built in bias into that. So we, with the gender, it wasn't really easy to understand if it was the correct split. So looking at age, uh, and comparing also to census data, we found out the mobile network data were not performing well in uh, the Newcastle area, simply because in Newcastle we've got two universities. So the, all the um, uh, younger groups of the population were not captured properly. So what we did was considering the census data um, and using the information coming from census and age, plus uh, the income coming from uh, uh, the mobile network data, which were much more um, precise and granular on that. Uh, so in this way, we created the agents. So now before moving to um, the attitudes towards shared mobility, have we got any questions? 
uh, we have one question. I just want to check, uh, Patricia, I can't suddenly can't see the slide. So I don't know if it's just me or whether anyone else experienced the same issue. Um, Nick, can you see the slides? I go to raise hand, but I, I can't see who is raising the hand. Um, there is one question, Patricia, from yeah, Sean. From Kiri. Sean. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is the thinking behind using OSM data for road network over ordnance survey? Oh, perfect. All the others can see the slides, guys. Oh, yeah, good. So it's just, me. <laughs> so it's just you need. <laughs> Renee and Sandy just <laughs> told me. Ah, my internet connection is also unstable. Fantastic. <laughs> so they think it behind um, open street data. And we thought about uh, using ordinance surveys as well. Uh, we wanted to have uh, open street data is richer in a sense. Um, and they're rapidly available. We also got access to Ordnance Survey, but we would like to understand the potential of having an open street map. Um, it's not a validated network. So when I say that I need to validate the network is because there are uh, a lot of errors included into that. So we included a process of screening and checking the network itself, but it's a very rich data. Uh, we also have included uh, cycling and uh, segregated paths coming from the OpenStreetMap. And then I think Ordnance Survey does not allow. We are in conversation with them as well. And I remember they told me they will have a uh, uh, richer data set, but at this point, uh, I've not used them yet. Bear in mind that all the data sets that we used, so census data, uh, OpenStreetMap data, land use data, they're all open data sets. So the land use data most of the time came from the consumer data center in Glasgow uh, and also an open database available from the Department for Transport and for the government as well. So we try to understand what's the limit, uh, what you can generate with the open data sets. So the only data sets that was uh, acquired really was the mobile network data to understand travel patterns. And then we generate the data through the, the survey of residents and also the present survey. Hi, where the activity patterns validated? Thank you. Um, the activity patterns uh, um, are uh, coming from the mobile network data acquired from Telefonica. So they acquire and they verify and validate the network as well, comparing the data from National Travel Survey and, uh, and census data as well. Uh, but this is a step that they did uh, instead of us. No, we are not going to open the microphone, Siamak, at the moment. Can you write your question, please? I don't know if Nick wants to open the microphone. We are tight on times at the moment, so we're going to take a couple of questions now, and I don't want to anticipate anything from what we have uh, in the next presentation. Are we so, all right with time now, uh, Patricia? Or, um... Yes, I got a lot of other questions coming, but yeah. uh, it's 10.24. Um, Can we answer one more and then um, if we have time at the end, then we can go back to these questions. Can I ask uh, to Brendan? Uh, didn't hear me. I assume you do not take into account private car availability or distribution on geographical. Oh. Questions are coming. Um, no, as I say, I don't want to anticipate anything because we take into account the private car availability uh, and it's depending on social demographics. So that's the reason why we also got the, the survey of residents as well. 
Okay, I think we will stop with the population with the question now because I got other three or four to reply. And yeah, so we and may I'll, go I'll, back to these questions when we have time at the end. Yeah, please yeah. keep the question coming. So I know that you got a lot, uh, but now we need to move uh, towards the, the work that we developed during the surveys. Uh, and we got Steve and Shaima presenting on this. I will stop my video. Steve. Okay. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, we carried out uh, in October 2019, we carried out uh, an online survey of 1,500 adult residents in Tyne and Weir. And the data we collected was um, reweighted to a representative uh, profile uh, of adults in that region. Um, and the survey itself covered um, current travel choices um, and um, patterns, the attitudes that influence those mobility choices and behaviours, a stated preference section, which Patricia will talk about shortly, and attitudes towards shared mobility, which is what we're going to focus on in the next few minutes. Um, so across the, um, across the sample, um, uh, many people recognised benefits from shared mobility. So about two thirds of people um, could see that it could bring less congestion, it could be better for the environment than driving, um, and it could be cheaper than running a car. Next slide, please. People could also um, see that there were con some concerns with travelling on shared transport, particularly, again, around two thirds level of people to see issues with it being less comfortable, concerns about privacy, concerns about uh, safety related um, to traveling potentially with, with people they don't know. Um, the next slide, please. So overall people were asked uh, how likely it would be to consider using shared transport. Um, so despite the fact that uh, a number of people um, and two thirds of people could see benefits from it, less than one in five, so 17% agreed that they would use it. And in fact, 66% disagreed with this. Uh, now, obviously in a, in a survey, um, an online survey, we provided a short description of what shared transport would be, but clearly um, it would be different to different people. Um, and it would be reasonable to assume that if you ask people about different types of shared transport, demand responsive versus um, ride hailing or an Uber, Uber pool type service, you'd probably get a different response. But that, that being said, albeit you can see the, um, some of the challenges around um, a shared transport service is that even if people see benefits from it, um, they're still not necessarily um, too keen on it. And um, the groups um, where the agreement was higher, you can see there were younger people, those aged under 40, and those with higher incomes. Um, Next slide, please. As part of the survey, um, we we're also able um, to use uh, an existing Department for Transport segmentation, um, which was developed from the National Travel Survey, I believe. Um, so we appended um, the, those segment allocations to, to the respondents in this survey. And we could see that two segments um, said they were more likely to share, the first being um, older, less mobile um, car drivers. And um, this group um, were probably more likely to agree because they're more likely to uh, share transport at the moment, be a passenger in the car or taxi or use ride hailing, um, typically because they had um, mobility issues themselves. The other group were the town and rural heavy car use. So this is interesting. These are very regular car drivers, um, um, Quite a, a few of these people live in rural areas, um, and it would seem that from, from the rubber responses that um, they were more likely, slightly more likely to use shared transport because they could see it had environmental benefits, could reduce congestion, and would also be cheaper for them. And they were, were stronger in agreement on those three uh, variables than the, the whole sample as, as well. Um, next slide, please. 
So my colleague Shyam is now going to um, speak about uh, the behaviour change implications of some of the things that we saw. Oh, thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. Um, so just making sense of everything that we found in terms of what it might actually be behaviour change. So looking at it from a psychological perspective, a lot of, if you like, unwanted or former behaviour has payoffs. So what we mean by payoffs is perceived advantages. So to relate this, for example, to something like um, unwanted eating habits, people might um, keep eating sugary snacks because it has the payoff of increasing their energy and reducing tiredness in the short term. So these intense short-term physical payoffs are likely to be quite powerful in keeping people doing unwanted or stopping them from looking at newer behaviors. So for example, with reliance on a car, the payoff of convenience and the speed of getting to a destination encourages people to keep the habit, even when they do recognize the advantages of alternatives. So for example, like they said, we saw in the survey, they do recognize that it would be cheaper, better for the environment to consider a shared mode of transport, but the payoff of the convenience and the speed keeps them relying on a car. So um, we can also look at this in terms of situational payoffs. So doing the unwanted behavior, at least temporarily, can get people out of something that they may not want to do. So for example, considering active travel, they may in their mind not actually want to exercise because in their mind they think, okay, I'm gonna to have to exert a load of energy for this. So for example, cycle or walk to my destination, or I may need to shower at my destination, et cetera. So these perceived barriers keeps them again in their, in their current um, travel behavior. So the way to overcome this is to identify what people see as the payoff and then promote this in the alternative travel method. So as Steve mentioned, some of the payoffs that people do identify are comfort, our privacy and our safety. So if we go to the next slide, please. So the steps that um, the payoffs can help with in order to lead to behavior change are in terms of knowledge to lead people from being unaware to aware slash informed. So this is both in terms of travel alternatives that actually exist. So again, through the survey, they were made aware of um, different modes of transport, shared transport, et cetera. Um, and also in terms of their features, advantages, et cetera, because if, even if they know of these alternatives, they may not actually be aware of how they run or what exactly the advantages are. In terms of approval, um, leading them from concern to reassured. So this is where the payoff challenge begins. We address their concerns, which are keeping them in their current behavior. So in this case, things like comfort, privacy, and safety. And um, we show them how these things can actually come into play even in the new travel mode. Intention, leading them from motivated to change to ready to change. So this can come, this will be a future thing to consider, but it could be things like practices like free trials, no obligation signups, et cetera. This can encourage ready to, to change because again, there's no negative payoff. There's no, um, they're not locked into a long-term contract or anything that could keep them psychologically wedded to their old behavior. If there's no downside to trying the new behavior, they may be more encouraged to give it a go. And then that's when the practice com comes in. This trial change of behavior will then eventually lead to maintenance and adoption of the new behavior when they see that the payoffs of the new behavior outweigh the payoffs of the old one. And this is what leads to lasting change. Thank you. Thanks, Shaima. So in order, when we, we run survey, usually people is um, considering what they intend to declare or simplify the actual uh, intention. So we run a stated preference survey to ask participants also to consider some hypothetical transport choice. DRT has not been um, uh, introduced in the time and year. So at the moment, they're not aware of this type of services. So we run this service because uh, we the project was supported in kind uh, from Nexus, from the, uh, the time and year, the passenger transport executive. 
and uh, they were planning to run a, a trial as well. So it's important to understand what is the perception before the trial and after the trial. And, and for us, it was important to understand what type of perceived cost um, the, the residents had towards uh, shared mobility and to the introduction of new mobility services. So we asked them uh, uh, to consider some hypothetical scenarios. We consider five transport um, service attributes um, and four transport modes for a urban trip. So we have not considered um, long trips, so short trips between three and, and 10 miles, so within the time of year, uh, both for uh, when you were traveling for work or when you were traveling uh, uh, for shopping and leisure. Um, the travel time is, has been split in three components. So we had a working time, a waiting time, and uh, an in transport time. Uh, we also consider the travel costs and they propose them different variability uh, and cost. Uh, and also the availability of uh, dedicated lands for active travel. The mode of transport that we consider is bus and underground, private cars, the shared mobility services and the active travel. But the active travel is uh, um, as a cycling and uh, scooter only, not the actual working. The working is embedded in each uh, public transport mode um, and in each other mode of transport. We considered um, as a follow up to generate a nested logic model. So these two behavioral models were also created for, for, uh, for the purpose of working, working and study. So when um, your time is less flexible and then for leisure and shopping and for incomes below 60K and above 60K because as uh, we Steve also found out during the surveys, people with an higher income tend to be more flexible, uh, but that depends uh, from their purpose of travel. So they're quite open to use shared mobility, but not when they, they got tight time scales to respect uh, uh, under a working schedule. Um, the results of the two nested logic model, we had uh, value of times, tailored uh, for the shared mobility and the other public transport modes. And these coefficients were then translated into the, the codes, uh, the coefficients that are using in the scoring function in the Maxim model. Um, so as um, early results from the stated preference survey, people um, perceived the in vehicle time as a negative utility, so they would like to minimize the, their time into shared transport. Um, actually, the, the perception of time is the same of active travel, which is quite high because during active travel, you got a physical effort and you would not expect this from shared mobility as well. But working and time uh, units are more or less the same of public transport. Um, but shared mobility got much higher value of time, so it's uh, is considered less. Then we got a difference between the two gender. Men prefer active travel over shared mobility. Female prefer, prefer shared mobility uh, more than that. The younger generation are more keen to try that, whilst the older generation perceived shared mobility as an extension of public transport. Um, and we also look at segregated path for active travel, which is something that allows active travel to go far beyond what you what you can have. Um, it, between the corner to corner service and the door to door service, because people perceive all these uncertainties around uh, the times spent within the shared mobility services, they actually prefer to walk and have a corner to corner, to corner services and more, um, and more certain, certainties around the travel times uh, into the shared mobility. So as an initial um, uh, uptake of the more responsive transport in tiny wheel, uh, from the state preference survey, we found that 8%, 8% will be the introduction of uh, initial demand for, for the DST and also that is, uh, we have been considering access to a car. Uh, if a car is available, uh, there was a question around that. They're also less keen to use shared mobility. So 
shared mobility is something that is included on top of what they currently have and their, their rabbits as well. Um, so as I said before, we had a conversion into the coefficients and the parameters used by Martin. Um, and we have used the standard scoring function that you can have in Matsim. So in Matsim, in agent-based modeling works that every, every agent receive a scoring according to how many activities they're able to do on time in the day. Everything that can delay or change the activity impact on the scoring of the agents itself. So when we score the activities, we take into account the duration of the activity, how much they wait, if they ate a late arrival, an early arrival, or even if the activity is shorter. Everything uh, has an impact on the scoring they receive at the end um, in the, in the Matsim. So bear in mind this, we had coefficients coming linked to the activities, so working and leisure, and also coefficients related to the type of mode of transport that you choose to have. So at the, our initial demand coming from the mobile network data, they knew which type of mode of travel they were able to use, but at a certain point in Matsim, you were able to introduce the DRT and they got another option available. So when you got the other option available, the agents start to consider what is more convenient or not. Um, and we also calculated the split coming from the stated preference survey, which is quite similar to what uh, uh, at the moment is happening in the tunnel we are. So that means it was a, a good one. Um, we got now a Q&A related to the attitudes towards shared mobility. So please uh, ask if you got some question around this area. Um, I'm not going to reply to the question that was done in the previous section. I can't see anything where you say, I raised an hand. I'm not able to see in the system who is raising the hand. So please write the question in the Q&A so I can track who has done the question or not. Uh, I see quite a lot of raised hands. So if we don't have uh, any question for this section, I will proceed. To the validation of the model itself? There is uh, there are a couple of questions there coming in. Uh, Patricia, the first question, if share mobility has a potential of 8%, is it worth doing? Good question. I can't see that. That's strange. Okay. Um, so I can reply you. I can reply you because we already we already introduced a DRT in the southwest of England during the model project, and uh, even there, the initial uh, perception of shared mobility was quite low. But when people well, what emerged from the from the set of preference survey in one of the questions that we had, um, we got because some of the users actually they use DRT in other parts of the country. They uh, it emerged that demand responsive transport and shared mobility has got the um, possibility to create some loyalty in the customer itself. Um, so it's a matter of trying the service in order to increase the demand from our operational point of view. From the modeling point of view, the initial demand is eight percent, but once they see the DRT and the cost, you can run also sensitivity analysis into the engine based model to try various costs of the shared mobility. Uh, you will see an increase of the uptake of shared mobility in, into the agents. For example, during the model project, we found out uh, that you got an increase of 20% in the use of shared mobility um, from the agents into the model. When you comes to real world uh, trials, you need to bear in mind the habits of the people and how much people invest in the, in the, the travel. So most of the time is not as good as uh, your DRT. Your, the DRT is good as long as it lasts. Most of the trials that we had were really short. They, they were deactivated uh, soon. So they, it, this creates an instability and people is not willing to change their, their, their travel patterns just for 10 months, one year. 
we found that most of the time these services have been quite discontinued, even if they got a very good uh, um, perception and very good uh, uh, feedback from customer itself. So 8% is something that is coming from a population that never experienced DRT, but because their attitude towards innovation and changing the travel patterns is quite good. So that was also part of the survey of residents. Once you introduce uh, the DRT in the tiny wheel, it is it's very likely that it's, it's going to be much higher than, than 8%. The reason why we use the model to understand if and where the service will be successful is because you need to consider the shared mobility integrated with the public transport systems. Because once you do this, you also attract the public transport users that are keen to use it. But this is not done in isolation. So you need a relationship and a, an agreement with the public transport operators as well in order to increase the share of the shared mobility. This is not so the agent-based model, and this type of modeling has been created to create to have an holistic approach to the transport systems. So these shared mobility are, are not seen in isolation. The eight percent is something that came from a set of, set of preference survey when you consider the service in isolation as well. Whereas the reality is not that. The reality is that you got parking fees paid. You got more more most of the time. Everybody in ten years got an annual pass for a bus company or for the metro. So these are things that needs to be considered during the trial. Um, but we had uh, experience that is much higher than 8%. So uh, Patricia, there are more questions, but something going on with my connection and I lost some of the previous questions here. I only um, see the so, question till Richard, which are in the previous session. Yeah, and I can't see any attendees, something going not quite right here. But there, there are a couple of questions I can see. Um, it, can you read is the that? Survey, is the survey online sample? And how did you recruit the online sample? Well, I'll take, take that one. So that's a question yeah. from Peter. Yeah, yes, Peter, it's a, an online survey. Um, the sample size was 1,500 uh, adult residents. Um, the achieved um, profile, there was a slight bias towards more more female respondents, um, fewer older respondents, and fewer um, people without um, a, a car at home. Hence, we reweighted um, the data on gender, age, and car ownership levels to be representative. Um, I think you had another question. How did you recruit the online sample? So we used an online panel and provided by a company called Savanta, um, which um, is a good way of um, re reaching a large coverage of, of people um, quickly and easily. Uh, Steve, can you see the other previous questions there? Because I cannot. Let me have a look. I have a question from Jeff. Yeah, that's, do you want that one, Patricia? What is the specification of shared transport? Is it mass and what's the pricing plan assumed? So the shared transport uh, um, is assumed to, to uh, we assume that the shared transport got an intermediate cost compared to the taxi and the bus uh, and, and the single bus ticket. That's because we found that people in the research that we did uh, during the model project, we found that people is not willing to accept um, higher values than, than public transport itself, but is an intermediate value between bus and taxi. So we assign, uh, they got three possibility. So one pound, one pound 50 and two pound 50 and five pounds. Uh, and people choose uh, uh, the, the, the preferred value for that. Um, is it mass? No, it's not mass. Mobility as a service is defined as integration of services. So once you include the shared mobility services into the agent based model and you consider multimodal public transport offerings, that then can become mass. But in order to have a proper mass service, that means uh, the customers need to acquire information on the journey and book for the journey from, from a single portal 
and from a single uh, uh, from having also an integrated ticketing. So from the modeling point of view, we are able to tell you what's the impact if you want to realize mass in an area, mobility as a service, but then you need to build in all these extra feature to allow the users to perceive this as mobility as a service, which is the integration of, of different types of services. If you don't have the DRT into a model, which cover first mile and last mile uh, of your travel patterns, uh, you can't have mobility as a service at all in any other type of um, transport models. Um, and then this is the model that has been developed to, to understand the demand. Uh, but for mobility as a service, you need also optimizing the flows, which is not in the scope of this model. But I would suggest to use typical platform like uh, micro simulation modeling to optimize the fleet. Uh, uh, and the demand that is coming from this model um, to have a, a proper optimized services uh, and, uh, uh, and also understand the pricing plan. What we can do is testing different types of pricing and do a sensitivity analysis, understanding what is what they're most sensitive. Um, could we see the SP survey questionnaires used? Um, well, I, I guess so. We are going to release uh, um, um, the, the questionnaire used during the survey of residents. Uh, the, I don't think the SP survey can be used because, because you got several scenarios, because we have five attributes and, and three type of travel plans. We generated more than 90 scenarios. Um, but I can share with you the, the presentation of the report. We are going to publish the work on the stated preference survey and the nested modeling soon in a journal. So we can share that with you, Jeff. Um, no, Chikaji, sorry. Um, How are we doing with time, Patricia? Are we think, have time for uh, another question in this? There's a question from Peter. Population synthesizers need a household or other type of people survey from which to draw the population. What did you use for this? Why population synthesis need an household? This was a question related to uh, the previous session. Oh, is it the previous session? Uh, technically, you don't need an household. You need to consider the travel patterns of the user in a certain area. And the reason why you have an household in previous uh, uh, methodologies to generate agent-based modeling is because you want to capture the travel diaries. But if you use the standard methodology, the information that you acquire is very rich, but allows you to generate a very small amount of agents, which is then not representative of your uh, city or even region. But the reason why we move towards mobile network data is because we overcome this problem in um, perceived bias, less detailed information, because they can also declare less uh, usual trips. Mobile network data is able to capture everything that is happening, so the, your current demand, and you don't really need an household because the fact that we use mobile, um, also the census data to generate the agents, we also have uh, car drivers, car passengers coming from national travel service. But with the census data, you also got the distribution of the age. So in our model, we also got children, which of course are car passengers, <laughs> not drivers. And um, so I don't need, uh, I don't need to generate an household in order to understand the, the travel patterns and the mobility needs of a population. What we got is enough to, to model mobility. It's different if you're trying to generate an agent-based model that is used to, to understand infrastructure and how the infrastructure is used. At that point, I would agree, I would use the traditional methodology uh, based on households. Uh, I think we should move on the validation of the model itself. Yeah, um, and then we can go back later. Okay, perfect.
Okay. Fabio That's is my presenting. Turn. Okay. Stop my video. That's your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone for joining today and so this is about the, um, the final step of the project uh, which I remember was a one year uh, fixed time project so we needed to focus specifically on uh, some element of the, um, the model performance that uh, were giving us uh, although it was a prototype some confidence uh, that the model was um, representing the reality um, despite some uh, limitations at the moment. Uh, the focus uh, has been on travel times in terms of verification because uh, uh, the data coming from mobile phone uh, uh, were quite rich in that sense and compared to traditional models uh, where the use of AMPR or other source um, provide limited number. Um, in terms of uh, the initial calibration, we, um, we focus on adjustment of scoring mechanism factor as explained before by Patrizia and also their weight in order to make uh, sure that the information coming from the stated preference RV, the, um, the cost value of time cost, the uh, marginal utilities, were actually um, uh, fine-tuned in order to optimize the daily plan and the virtual agents. And the initial calibration uh, phase was, uh, um, uh, so at this stage was a high level, although we focus on a specific characteristic of the agent-based model. Next slide, please. So in terms of the traditional, uh, compared to what we have uh, um, implemented in terms of uh, calibration, we cover most of the uh, steps, the network, road choice, demand matrices, uh, and travel time. Uh, the assignment in terms of volume, we, at the moment, as I said, we focus on travel time because that was the richest uh, database available. And that was also slightly different in terms of uh, quantity compared to traditional models. Next slide. Uh, the the checking uh, has been uh, initially we um, we mentioned about the use of uh, street, uh, open street map data, and at this stage was uh, um, the sort of mix between traditional and more um, data driven uh, checking, considering and avoiding uh, visible or quite um, identifiable. Uh, bottlenecks, queue length throughout the um, the period, so to avoid any uh, skewing or uh, travel time uh, distortion within the model. However, um, we within the time scale we didn't implement the traffic light, which I will mention in the few in the next few slides. Um, what is the implication at the moment? Uh, but we know that, so we um, we are just comparing what expected and with the limitation of uh, the modeling setup. Next slide. So in terms of the overall um, analysis as, uh, and in terms of uh, calibration and validation has been based on a uh, result from simulation of 10 iterations. Uh, I have to say that usually in uh, when you have uh, the time and also you analyze different scenarios, uh, you, you have to run several hundreds of iterations in order to make sure the convergence is uh, um, stabilized. However, we have seen uh, an initial stabilization over the last few uh, iterations. So we, um, we wanted to really make at the end of the project some uh, sense of the um, level of accuracy and the representation of the real, real world data. Um, as I said before, the uh, travel time available based on mobile network data were quite rich, uh, 47,000 uh, OD uh, travel times combinations. And as you can see in the, in the picture, uh, in the graph, the, there was a, a range of um, um, trips duration between minutes and uh, seven hours, which was quite uh, broad and uh, also unable to look at the different parts of the day. Um, but also we noticed that there is a, of course, a skew and a, um, a value coming from the uh, model at the moment, which especially in the um, shorter trips or so more urban related area uh, trip uh, is uh, uh, underestimated. And that is uh, not in terms of estimation, but is actually because the vehicles are going faster. And the faster element is due to the uh, absence of traffic light which um, in terms of uh, a note, we can consider within uh, a urban area, traffic light can play a big role. 
so at the moment was actually to see the consistency and uh, the representation of the the curve is actually um, uh, quite matching, although the magnitude of uh, the peak is uh, is, still, is uh, there in terms of peak, but not uh, in terms of uh, ratio. So it's about 45% uh, underestimation in the peak. If you go into the next slide, however, we see that the, um, the uh, aggreg aggregation of the data towards specific route that were assigned to origin destination uh, of um, number of agents uh, going through that route uh, through the day. Um, so as we increase the number of agents, so the, the majority of the, the agents are going through all these specific ODs, which is what actually in traditional model we tend to, um, to focus on specific section where uh, there, there is a quite high volume. So we are sure also that the variability of the trial time is uh, confined. And as you can see, uh, uh, from five to 10 agents, at least uh, on that specific route, which is a small number, but still a, a good number to start to average and make uh, a statistical uh, meaning, uh, we see a quite high correlation, uh, which gives confidence that the, the model is actually quite stable and representing uh, travel time, although there is still that 45% uh, underestimation, which is, uh, if you notice the slope in that specific graph. If you move into the last group of the, um, slides, we can, uh, oh, there are previous one. Okay, thank you. So as I mentioned, there is a, an, um, overall, the, um, the behavior of the model is quite stable uh, in terms of sensitivity through different route and different uh, number of uh, uh, agents per route. Um, however, as uh, I anticipated, the, the difference of about 25% in terms of um, lower uh, or actually faster travel time from the model, um, if we consider the implication of uh, traffic light in urban area, that can have easily um, an, an impact of between 10 and 20%, uh, just one minute out of uh, seven or 10, which is the average um, travel time we have seen in terms of the majority of the distribution. That has implications. So we are confident that in, in implementing and uh, improving the, just this traffic signal within the, uh, the model will definitely give uh, uh, much more uh, alignment and uh, close representation of the real world travel time. So in conclusion, the last slide, uh, we can say that uh, the model overall, considering also the amount of information and the free uh, open source, except the mobile phone data input, um, we consider as a given quite a, um, a, a robust um, starting point in terms of prototype to, to work with. And of course, as uh, um, mentioned, there are several steps that we can improve. Uh, on top of the traffic light, also uh, making sure also uh, suburban and external routes are um, uh, double checking in terms of uh, both speed and um, uh, junk specific junction delay, uh, which may cause bottlenecks uh, occasionally. Uh, but also refining uh, one key element of the um, uh, model is uh, usually tends to uh, randomize the output uh, in terms of exit or entrance to zones in terms of the specific point within the zone. So if zones are quite large, like middle super area, it may happen that the, actually the choice of the model, uh, which is random, may uh, be skewed towards specific area. Uh, and that means an extra trip, an extra minute or two within the same area. If you look at the Northumberland or other rural area, that may have a big impact into the, into the travel time. That's something we will uh, like to work on a bit more in terms of making sure that doesn't impact on the overall travel time of the model. And that's my conclusion. Thank you. Any questions? I will look Any questions through. from any. the audience? I'm just going through if there is any new one. So, any question on this section? Well, we are going to go through the backlog of questions during the Q&A at the end of the session. 
and we are on time, so we've got yeah. a, a good half an hour for these questions. Yeah, I'm looking if there are any new one after 11 a.m. <laughs> I can see some from 10.50, 10.40. So the last question is from David, but it's related yeah. to the consumer's cost, so it's not definitely not for you. Mm -hmm. I believe if there are no at the moment, there may be a few later. So yeah. uh, I'm still, I will be still here until the end. So uh, maybe they, they want a bit of time to reflect on what they've seen. Thank you anyway. Thank Thanks, you. Fabio. So we, whoop, sorry. We will proceed uh, towards the last, last couple of slides, really. So you can do all the questions you want and we can also switch on uh, your videos and allow you to talk. Uh, that will be much better for the questions. So to conclude, I know there has been a quite quick uh, summary of what we've developed um, and you will have further details coming out if you keep in touch with us. So one of the benefits of this methodology, which is different from the standard methodology to generate agent-based models, uh, is the still the holistic approach. So your bottom-up approach, the agents and interaction between the agents in space and time allows you to understand uh, the global behavior of the population. Uh, but this type of approach allows you to integrate all the transport services that you got. At the moment with first-time model, we are limited to the multimodal uh, public transport, which is not considering uh, the contribution of shared mobility and private on demand. Uh, transport. With this platform, you're able to integrate all the fixed schedule public transport, the shared mobility, but also you're able to include rail services, aviation, and maritime services. This is all uh, can be studied using mobile network data as well. Uh, as, as it stands, the model is a digital twin for the time and year because we never had the opportunity to implement the demand responsive transport in, in time and year because of the pandemic starting. Uh, so it was not a, a priority at that time. Um, and bear in mind that this project has been developed in the last year. So I know many massive models requires years and years to be able to reach uh, a good, uh, good level of uh, precision. Uh, the work uh, has been quite complex and involved several uh, type of uh, uh, skills. Uh, we have improved a lot compared to the previous study that we've done in the southwest of England on the generation of the synthetic population. The, the ability to generate the, um, daily travel plans from mobile network data and to explore and analyze each type of travel patterns that we got in the area has been immensely uh, useful for the follow-up project that we had uh, from the demand. We can understand the uptake of shared mobility much easier. Um, and also it's a shared mobility that is not working in isolation with the rest of the public transport system. So most of the time we have found during the foundation study, all these services were deactivating pretty soon because they were not looking at an integration with the public transport. Actually, they were looking at a spontaneous integration, but they were never considered the richness of services that were already uh, existing on the ground. So shared mobility can't exist in isolation but needs to exist in order to realize the mobility as a service vision. Um, it's interesting from the use of the mobile network data, we are able to understand how residents behave, because usually residents go very short trips, uh, up to four or five trips in one day, uh, and they integrate educational trips with shopping and leisure. Above that, uh, you got distribution, local, uh, local or long distribution of logistics. So you, it's interesting to see how the travel patterns uh, and different strategy and when the distribution starts. So in the Northeast, for example, we notice quite a lot of long distribution starting during the PM peak, which shouldn't be ideal crossing the city center of Newcastle during the PM peak. Uh, but you got quite a lot of local distribution as well that emerged. Um, and a lot of dependency between rural areas nearby the town and weir uh, with uh, uh, local distribution of goods. As a further work for the model, we need to acquire extra data sets because the model is so extensive that we require uh, much more uh, 
data to validate uh, the, the flows on the network, uh, as Fabio said, and we require extra run of the model to calibrate the model itself. So bear in mind this um, run in um, 80 hours, just for 10 iterations. It's a good model, it had a good performance, uh, but it requires a lot more. We were thinking of having 150 iterations to reach the, the full stability, which require quite a lot of uh, computationally intensive uh, uh, effort and time as well to allow the model to run properly. Uh, we need a further investigation because uh, the transport uh, appraisal guidance that currently use, they require to include also agent-based modeling and be adapted to this type of new tools that uh, can be used. So I'm thinking more, we have used the variable demand modeling uh, a lot to, to, to look uh, around the type of activities that we can generate, but also the highways assignment and the public transport assignment, because we, the assignment that you got in agent based model comes from both points of view. So as you stand, the model is uh, this type of uh, prototype is able to forecast demand for travel for shared mobility. We are able to test policy intervention and to, use, to encourage the use of multimodal mobility. So not strictly restricted to shared mobility, but also to understand any type of mobility services that should be activated alongside rail services or bus services or underground services. The tools that we are generated are platform agnostic. So we can transfer them in any other type of platform as long as they support uh, the activity chains. So um, not the origin uh, destination aggregated trip based approach. Um, and uh, we are able to integrate uh, this tool with, with other type of software as well. We are not, uh, this tool is is, has been created to explore urban mobility but it can be integrated with, with a traditional four-step model or micro-simulation model, thinking about uh, PTV, for example, with a mass package. This is possible to be integrated with uh, our legacy tools. So, so we're not going to lose all the models that we generated in the past, just because we are looking at the, this type of urban demonstrator. This methodology works well in a data-rich environment. So one of the questions that we are exploring at the moment is understanding what is the performance in rural environment. Most of the time, rural areas are perceived as uh, areas with low demand uh, for travel, but is it really like that? Nobody really explored the performance of mobile network data in rural areas. Uh, the local authorities, they run in tight budgets, uh, and most of the time, they don't know what type of question um, to answer. So what we are doing at the moment is alongside the, the development of scenario testing for the demand platform, uh, which is looking at the areas uh, in, in the East Coast, so in the North Tyne side. I know it's quite popular at the moment, the city council, but it's the North part of Tyne. We are uh, at the boundary with the, the Northumberland. We're exploring type of scenarios there, um, but also we're trying to understand what's the performance of the mobile network data in uh, uh, rural areas. Are the travel patterns different? So we are, at the moment, we're working on uh, assessing sustainable transport solution for rural mobility, assets project, uh, as everybody <laughs> likes to call him. And we are generating three case studies in three different areas. So Northumberland, Somerset, and Essex. Um, these three case studies are different for density of population, but also public transport provision. And uh, they got different type of relationship with the urban areas. So for example, Northumberland is still part of the demand. We are going to focus on the type of relationship that they got with the Tannin Weir. Tannin Weir is a pole of attraction for um, an area which is uh, mainly rural. So it is the, the lowest density that you can have. Uh, whilst uh, Essex uh, is a uh, urban areas with uh, quite significant rural. And Somerset is largely rural. So there is no urban area around. These are all independent towns. And we have seen till now, we already acquired mobile network data. That the travel patterns are quite uh, similar to what you can have in urban areas, both in Northumberland and Essex. But for example, for Somerset, they're quite different. The, um, the travel patterns that you got 
are different because they don't require to travel that far. There is no pole of attraction from the urban areas. Um, so we, if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, be in touch. Um, and if you are interested in knowing more about the demand project, uh, at the moment we're running the dissemination, we've been to the European Transport Conference and we will go to the ITS Congress and Modeling World. But we also got some papers already published that um, we, can, uh, we can send you if you're interested in, in knowing more. As I said, the team is quite big, it's cross-disciplinary. We got transport modeler, data scientist, software developer. Um, it's not um, transport economics, it's not the traditional um, tools. We require quite a lot of uh, development and data analysis in this uh, in this project in order to provide the correct uh, data input with the right granularity with the map for the Maxim uh, platform as well. Um, so now we have finished. I think we are you are allowed. Nick will allow you to do the questions online now. Uh, so we are going to take uh, all the questions that we had. I think we can are. We, can we start with the questions that are already there from the previous ones that haven't been answered. Yeah. Let's just go back to Colin's uh, take. Got a, a few questions. So one of them is about um, activity types appear to be to aggregate. Education, for example, could be split into primary, secondary, and tertiary. Also, didn't see anything on escort escort trips which strongly influence work trips. Um, I think just, just to remind ourselves that this model is a prototype model. Um, it's, not, it's not a sort of hunky-dory, up and running, ready to go model to test so many different policies. So when we started this project, um, I and colleagues within the DFT, we didn't know much about um, agent-based model. We've heard about it. And we've heard people say about uh, these models is good for ABC. So we started this uh, exact project to actually see it's like a proof of concept. Can it actually be built um, using the data that we have that uh, Katapult um, pre presented earlier? So just to remind uh, people that it is, it is not yet a sort of like a finished product. So this is a starting point for us to get to know this methodology and it's proven that yes, the data is there and we can build it to test um, actually not just the shared mobility in the future, it can be any other type of uh, policies that we might like to do. So uh, Patricia, if you've got any more to add to that. So escort so trips are actually included into the model. Uh, when you acquire mobile network data, uh, the network providers allows you to mark uh, um, commuting to work trips uh, as work, uh, even if they're doing uh, uh, educational trips as well. So when we analyze the model, and I say we got uh, two, three, four trips in one day, uh, most of the educational trips uh, are actually being done uh, uh, in the Interpick 2, which is early afternoon, uh, so from 1.30 till, um, till 4 o'clock. So what we capture as educational trips, in fact, uh, I think that these are primary, primary school trips uh, when you require a child to be escorted. In the model itself, you've got children because uh, the, the, the agents were generated following the distribution of age uh, from the census data and not from the mobile network data. Um, all the other trips coming from secondary school and tertiary school, which I think you mean universities, these are also included because uh, most of the time children are going there uh, using public transport. So these are coming from public transport data and public transport patronage is coming from the Nexus data as well. Of course, we can't know if there are, uh, what is the age of the person that is using the bus. Um, but as a, as a trip and as a travel pattern is included into the, into the synthetic population as well. Uh, the type of trips, if it's an educational trips done within certain time and within certain uh, locations, like to reach Newcastle University or Northumbria University, which are in the city center of Newcastle, these are marked as education as well or work and study. 
So that means that when they're traveling, your scoring function will have uh, an higher value of time because you need to reach an area because you're working and study. Of course, it's not as precise maybe as you want to be, but at that point, do you really this type of model to be able to specify the educational trips uh, uh, of a population? So this model gives you and a global understanding of where is your demand for shared mobility. Um, so globally, you still got all the trips, but if you want more detail, then at some point I will not use an agent-based model of this at this scale, but I would revert that uh, towards another transport model. I hope that I replied. I don't know who is the person that did this question. Um, uh, Richard Khan had a question earlier about why was Scotland only one zone when it's so close to the study area? Um, actually, you don't have so much uh, trips going towards Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, we had to take a choice as well, and uh, we preferred there were much more travel patterns going towards the south. So because acquiring Scotland is quite big, <laughs> we didn't want to <laughs> create uh, a, a national transport model altogether. So we had to take a choice. Um, but yes, this, potentially we can include also Scotland, um, but um, in um, the trips towards Scotland were more between Northumberland uh, and Scotland as well. It was one road use, and mainly was um, long trips done by car, uh, or rail trips as well. So it um, wasn't really useful for the purpose of the shared mobility, um, which uh, our initial scope was to include shared mobility in an area serving the residents of the town and weir. Um, you can also include Scotland, but I guess I should understand better what are the travel patterns in Scotland, because Scotland is not part of a urban area, but I need to understand better how the mobile network data perform in rural areas, and then I can transfer the methodology in areas like Scotland, because you've got Edinburgh and Glasgow, which are quite big, but I guess there is a lot of movement between Berwick upon Tweed and uh, the boundary on the south of Scotland, and also the boundary between Northumberland and the, the, the lowlands as well. But this will increase a lot to the computational time of the model if I include also Scotland. So I need another year just to develop Scotland itself. Because <laughs> okay. bear in mind, we have one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to draw a line somewhere. <laughs> so this is where Richard Scotland West might have been the same. <laughs> So what's the oh. well, uh, question from David? I can't remember if that was answered. Why? Where did cost to consum consumers feature in the modeling? Is it exogenous or otherwise? Uh, Maximum is exogenous cost, but I will not. I think you should talk with Mario about this. I think you are. Uh, probably working in business business schools or more economic background. So uh, I will put you in contact with uh, our discrete choice model that has done the behavioral models as well. Um, next questions? Uh, Martina. There are a of, oh, sorry. There are a couple, a couple of questions from Peter as well before that. Yeah. Um, Peter ask um how did you put attributes like income age etc which you use in the utility function on the um nmdm mobile phone data agents so we generate a, a, a new scoring function actually which have then uh, not implemented because we had to remove the, the standard scoring function from maxim and the new scoring function that was developed to consider age, gender, and income. So you could have considered all the uh, agent's preference uh, 
and attributes into the, the scoring function as well. Matsim allows you to substitute to the scoring function, but because of, um, of the running time of the model, we will we use the coefficients that we generated from the standard preference survey, and we didn't replace the scoring function in the end. But the formulation is ready. It's just a matter of including that into the Matsim model as well. Have you got another question? Uh, yeah, is it, can, I mean, Mar Mar Martina Juvara, do you want to add, um, ask your questions? I think some people raised their hands as well. Um, Nick, can Martina be allowed to speak? I can't see the-, the... I'm still there. I can see the question from Martina at 10.44. So is the cost of implementation worth the effort of the outcome? That's from the previous question, wasn't it? Is Martina here? No. I can see- so Maybe. I on top yeah. of the questions, there, yeah. is, there is open, answer, and dismiss. Maybe if you click on open, at the moment, maybe you are yeah. answered. I can click on open, and I can see the one from Jeff. Jeff. Oh, um, that's Martin. Yes, I think I, now my screen has changed. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Okay, well, thank you for, for giving. I was trying to, to write the question. Uh, I, I'm a planner and we are in, in Essex, we are seeing lots of very large scale developments um, being encouraged to, to embrace a 60% mixed sustainable mobility of which uh, shared uh, transport is one, but, but you know, the, the whole cocktail. But the uh, planning applications, of course, use very traditional models. And they basically, the approach of the consultants has been, well, we assume that 60% will not travel by car and only 40% of the cars, we model 40% of the cars and uh, we put in place a travel plan for the 60%. Uh, but of course, they cannot model how the behavior changes like you, you showed through your model. And there is no way to make that promise credible in any way. And because we are talking about 25, 30,000 homes, it's a huge thing to get wrong. So I was wondering, yeah. I was wondering, is your model aimed to achieve that goal of saying we model the behavior change and we model a different way of moving? Um, and that would support development eventually and decision making. At the moment, is mainly um, aspirational. Let's say you know this. This uh, uh, cannot be proven, and therefore is not convincing. Uh, people are not buying into this as a as, as a concept that is worth pursuing. So this model, the purpose of the Niman project was establishing a solid and scientific methodology to produce age and basin modeling in a standardized way in order to allow the Department for Transport to understand um, what was required and also to pass it to industry to develop uh, um, something more stable than the Maxim itself. So Maxim is a research tool as well. But during other project, which was called model, we developed an age and basin model for newly developed area. Uh, in that case, the use of mobile network data is even more important because most of the time you don't have tra recent travel patterns coming from uh, surveys that can be time consuming and very limited as well. So the mobile network data was much helpful in Bristol in, the, in a newly built area called Filton Kings. Mm -hmm. And in that area, we actually developed uh, a trial um, and the demand model was able to inform uh, the operator as well. The operator was called Esoterics. Um, 
So they did not work with us in order to implement this. So we told them where is the possible area where you, when you include the demand responsive transport, where you are going to, your demand is coming from. So the agent based model is able to reply to this question. So if you got 50 or 30 uh, house that comes out uh, from nowhere, um, you are able to generate a demand because uh, in each household, uh, I think the consultants are able to tell you how many people are in that household. And you also are able to understand what's, uh, what's the, the type of income uh, that are going to be attracted. So you can uh, use the agent based model to understand where this new demand uh, can go. Based on the demand response transport, you can also try different routes. Uh, I know that in Tan and Weir, for example, they're introducing shell mobility inside new, new developments uh, and linking up the shell mobility services to, with the public transport as well. This type of model is able to test uh, where the demand is going to be. Saying that everybody's going to use uh, the car just because uh, this, uh, this is a legacy um, might not all be true. Uh, that depends on the, the attitude of people living in Essex. We are also running a survey in Essex to understand the attitudes towards shared mobility and new technologies. So if a new service comes up, what is going to happen, what people is willing to do. Uh, from what I can see from the travel patterns that you got in Essex, you pretty much have the same travel patterns uh, that we had in the Northeast. So the methodology can be applied and can be used to test these type of things. The problem is because it's not, uh, uh, consultants are not able to use yet this type of tools because not enough guidance have been generated for them. So that's the main issues that you might have. Yeah, so that, uh, can I just jump in, Patricia? So yeah. relate, related to Peter's question, actually, how much more shift to shared mobility did you get from each current mode? So that basically, that's the purpose of the agent-based model, to be able to estimate mode shift from um, a specific scheme that we're going to test. So in this case, this model was built to test shared mobility. However, yeah. however, I think we were limited by budget at the time and didn't go f as far as that, but it can be used to um, estimate uh, the mode share. So that linked to um, uh, the question about um, whether it actually can uh, have 60% share um, or you know only 40% yeah. private card. So, the so these are um, the sensitivity analysis that I mentioned, Fabius mentioned, I think, towards the end. So once you include the shared mobility, um, the, the, the base case scenario run without the shared mobility services. Uh, the model shift that we initially included was 10%. The uh, same model shift that we introduced uh, during, the, during the model project. When you... I can talk to you about the results of the demand responsive transport introduced in the south uh, uh, west of England. Uh, the model shift that you obtain when you introduce shared mobility is 20% uh, with a cautious, uh, in, uh, cautious introduction. So we allow them to, to shift uh, 5, 10%, and 20%. Uh, when you are allowed to have a 10% model shift into, in the innovation strategy of Maxim, um, people using shared mobility, um, so the agents shift from 20% from private transport, and you get another 20% increase in the, in the share of public transport as well. I don't know if this requires uh, answer your question. Um, I can pass you the paper that we have uh, available from the model project, so you know what was the the model shift uh, for the shared mobility. Thank you. Is it so possible? Oh, thanks, Martina. Um, if you want to be in contact with us, uh, we are working with Essex County Council as well for this. Um, is it possible to incorporate value of time distribution across agents in Matsim? So the value of 
time should be very interesting to see how travel patterns model would change if value of time heterogeneity is incorporated, a weakness in using equity in value of time in traditional models, perhaps. So the value of time that we are we have value of time coefficients. So the, the marginal utilities that we use in Maxim are actually deri deriving from the behavioral models and we have value of time distribution for the agents, but you need to convert them. So what do you obtain is that these beta values um, and travel patterns change according to, uh, to the marginal utilities. So depending on the type of activities that you are doing um, and the type of mode of transport that you're using, it is also changing. But we don't use value of time in maximum we use marginal utilities. Um, if you want to, Jeff, I can put you in contact with our um, discrete choice model and you can talk more about this conversion between value of times and utilities per hour that we got in Maxim. So we got Corgani. Siamak, yeah. Uh, can Siamak be allowed to speak so he can uh, ask questions directly? Uh, Nick, please allow um, Siamak Corgami. Corgami. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Siamak. Hello, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for letting me to talk. Uh, I, 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 I probably I don't expect unnecessary answer. I just want to share two, three observations, and you pick up as you wish and answer it. We can use <laughs> other platforms. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, it's, it's, the, the discussion is, is mainly around the, uh, the activity based demand modeling part. It's quite interesting to see that you are doing these things. You've got all the principles in place in terms of modeling. One observation that I would like to share with you is uh, there's a lot of emphasizes in terms of using mobile phone data. Uh, and there are ways, methodologies to drive uh, activities through matrices, MNDs, these sort of things. Uh, but there are errors in mobile phone data, especially around trip purposes, uh, especially around the time of day of travel, uh, especially certain assumptions need to be made in terms of anchor points, constraint, uh, duration of the activities, these sort of things, which I'm not sure how that could be captured, uh, the current uh, sets of technology with the mobile phone data. And I think it, it, it introduced significant biases uh, in that those data sources and might be questionable for the purpose of verification. Uh, because, well, there are certain strengths. We can pick up home, work, education, but there are certain activities, pick up, drop off activities, yeah? And quite an important shopping activities. All these things which usually drop in the less than 15 minutes, 30 minutes duration in most cases. That's one observation I wanted to share with you. The other part is, uh, it's a lot, you're using Matsim and the, the, it's quite well developed and uh, discussed in terms of the methodology in the in the industry. But the emphasizes in Matsim, I think it's mainly around activity pattern and and scoring of that rather than activity generation, which I think is quite essential for what we want to do in this country. Uh, there are other data sources that we can consider, I mean, uh, for, for this purpose. I mean, we have time use data, which I assume should be, should become, we could become available for the purpose of this research for DFT. That might be useful. And it's a decent sample size that you can use for verification. Um, and also uh, there are, I mean, you say two. This is the third observation. That's a third one. That's that's a last one. I, <laughs> that. I can stop here. I stop here. I should. I should. I should respect the, the time. That's fine. I can pick up things later. <laughs> Do you want to reply to the first two? <laughs> uh, it's up to you based on your time availability. So, I think uh, we are with time. Okay, we got. We are good with time. So the mobile network data that we use huh, is not the standard mobile network data. So it might not be subject to the same errors that you got to origin destination matrix. Because we got higher granular data at the lower superatomic area, and uh, also the temporal data set data are much more refined. 
Um, so we are able to capture chips that normally when you use uh, origin destination matrix, you're not able to use because you use the middle superactive areas. Um, and that's the, that's the beauty to work with Telefonica, that they, they did not limit us to work with the standard data sets. Uh, and the trip chains that I mentioned, it was created just for us. Um, I asked them to create this type of for, format, aggregation really, it's an aggregation that is coming uh, um, before uh, creating an actual origin destination matrix as well. And we retain information of all the activities. And this has been done because Martin is able, as you say, to model activity patterns. Uh, we are aware there are some limitations. That's the reason why we generate the methodology in the demand project. So we are able to enrich this data to overcome the limitation. We are aware that they got a problem in short trips, but this is due to the network itself and the way we collect in the volume through data. If it is triangulation coming from the towers. So the short trips, the one between really between two and five miles, are not captured properly. So what we don't capture is walking, cycling, short trips done by car, done locally, which uh, is what I said when I introduced the slide on the generation of activity plans, it is uh, the one trip chain. So the internal trips, uh, which 20% uh, of them are, rich, are actually internal trips not properly captured. Um, and every network provider is also aware of this, but the only way to overcome this is specifically looking at uh, shorter trips and understanding with other type of data source, what is the, the patterns of that. Uh, the other thing is uh, we need to bear in mind what you want trying to model, because what we wanted to model was a shared mobility operated by um, uh, standard vehicles or, or a minibus. So we don't want to discourage activity-based uh, activ active travel. Usually, when you you travel two miles, you tend to have you tend to walk or you tend to cycle, especially in Newcastle, because you got quite a lot of segregated uh, paths, you tend to, uh, to walk. So the short trips are in this area uh, and account for 20% of the one trip chain. The majority of people actually, they're doing a, a, fifth, a two trip chain. So they go to work and then go back, or you've got education shopping trips. So the travel patterns stretch between three and five. So if you want to act with a demand response to transport, your target is creating the model shift towards the public transport. Uh, so you, what you really target are your residents here between uh, two and five. Um, so I think I replied to the first one. The second one, you're right, there is a limitation in Maxim, but you're not allowed to change the um, the activity schedules. So you're not allowed to reschedule activities if you are late to postpone and move activities. So in the sequence of the activities, but this is a problem that Maxim developer in, uh, in Berlin and Zurich are aware of, and they're currently working towards solving that. It's an open software and we are, uh, we are developing the tools uh, at the best that we can. Um, so the main issues is if you tend to arrive late and you allowed not to, so there is a, something that we put on Maxim is you're not allowed to change your activity schedule. So your initial activity schedule is the one that you need to keep, which is fine for me because what we are modeling is an average day in a month. So these are trips that you do every day because you need to do them, because you need to pick up kids, because you need to go to work, and you need to go to shopping. Uh, so these are something that you generally, you don't shift unless something happens. Because this is a strategic model, we should not be have um, the need to change the schedule. But if this happens and you allow the maximum to change the schedule, which is something that you can change, the first thing that is dropped out is the longest activity. Most of the time is staying at home or going to work, which is, something that we can't afford. So at the moment, I would advise if you want to use, continue to use Maxim to lead it as a fixed schedule initial demand for travel, 
and you work with that. And there are the, there are the what is the third? I don't know if you got. I think we got time. What is the third observation, Kemak? Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, first, the third one was uh, so why we are if you're if you're validating. Uh, things i mean look you look at the duration one 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 item that you can pick up is looking at the national travel survey probably basically looking at your trip rates that you ultimately generate as part of this looking at the frequency of tours because you can convert uh national travel travel survey to tour based data with some assumptions with some limited assumptions i think that might be useful i'm not questioning your um, apology i know it's our constraint of travel survey as well, especially for the shorter trips. Correct, but you're, are you using that for the validation as well? Yes, I think Fabio has done it. Yes, okay. not at the moment. Not at the moment because, as I said, we uh, we haven't had a chance to, to complete the, um, with the traffic light. So before to, to do up the, the final validation, we uh, I think the next step I mentioned would be necessary before we can actually uh, make that uh, validation or comparison uh, because at the moment will uh, will not probably reflect uh, the shorter trip as i said because there are uh, some uh, traffic light limitation uh, in terms of delay at junctions so once those are implemented definitely uh, that will be the step we will take sure thank you very useful thanks very much for let speak letting me to talk thank you so much colin uh, yeah, Collins, I want to, uh, Collins, do you want to speak? Uh, one question left from you and you had uh, a few questions earlier. Uh, can we let Colin, Colin Tay to speak, please? Uh, Peter also raised his hands. Colin. Yes, I've seen, I've oh, seen Colin Peter's hands. So Colin's disappeared now. Shall we let Peter speak? Can I do it? I like to talk. I don't see their questions anymore. Peter. So how come Peter's gone again now? Oh, going to panel again. Yeah, me and Peter just dropped down. <laughs> oh, it, they, they've gone. As okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Peter, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's interesting, um, interesting study, and it's nice that people are exploring the, the use of MND. Uh, I have a few technical questions, which I'll, I'll catch up with you guys at some point or other. Um, Can but, you introduce um, yourself, Peter? Oh, it's Peter Davidson, Peter Davidson Consultant. Oh, Peter, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, sorry, I, I, I don't quite know about this tech. I thought I was visible, but anyway. Um, yeah, if you write down Peter Davidson, I know who you are. <laughs> But just Peter is a bit. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's it's really good, especially get um, DFT um, dipping their toes into these these models. Um, um, my, my question is, I suppose, a bit tongue in cheek, really. Um, I'd like to know whether DFT are now accepted the the use of um, of agent based models for um, looking at um, these sort of new modes of transport, or indeed indeed other things. Um, I suppose convinced may be a bit strong, but um, it would be interesting to hear, um, you know, whether DFT would be would be open to getting sort of solutions, mo modelling solutions like this uh, applied to to these sorts of problems um, in their um, applications for for funds and things. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I think we are at DFT. Um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of DFT here, but also my personal um, uh, view here that we are open to always, I think we are always open to any new uh, modeling methodology. I know the guidance seems to be rigid, but um, we always allow innovation. And as long as you can provide evidence that your modeling uh, tool or method works and all the validation and calibration is done and the, the, the tool is fit for purpose, so by doing this project, we are getting to know this um, this new type of modeling. So yes, we are beginning to open up to all these new um, um, methods, um, which is which is actually quite good to see. 
Ah, it's very comforting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Look forward to um, exploring this further, especially the this new modeling stuff with you guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Collins Tay, can you speak, please? Colin? Can't hear you. <laughs> don't know what happened there. I don't think a Colin is still with us. Colin, can you start speaking? Please? Not in the list of the participants. He, he actually somehow moved to panelists. <laughs> yes, and he's also not mute, so. <laughs> oh, maybe problem with uh, Colin. I got a question on autonomous vehicles. Yeah, okay. Do you want to answer that, um, Patricia? Yeah, it's Colin from our Collins. Yeah. Try to. Uh... So, the project was not on autonomous vehicles. So, uh, because of the supporting kind was coming uh, from the Northeast Combined Authority in the Nexus. So for them, the priority is activate a shared mobility services now. Uh, autonomous vehicles are extremely expensive. And at the moment, we've got another project looking at uh, shared mobility uh, with autonomous vehicles, which is uh, under development, it's funded from uh, Innovate UK. And uh, it will support, we go to modeling for supporting a shared mobility services run with autonomous vehicles as well. So it's something that we are doing, but I can't say anything else. You need to watch uh, the development of the SubCity project, which is also developed by uh, the Connected States yeah. itself. This something in the past has been done on Merge Greenwich. Yeah. Uh, uh, we can was, share uh, a paper with you yeah. on that. Uh, Merge Greenwich uh, project was also developed. Uh, we had a demand model developed uh, uh, in Maxim as well, which interfaced with uh, uh, an agent based on a micro simulation model developed by men, but also by the consortium. And uh, the demand model interface with the optimization tool to understand uh, flows uh, and fixed optimization and pricing plan of the shared service as well. So this is a project that I finished uh, three years ago. So you should be able to find more information on the Merge Greenwich project. And I can give you uh, the final paper on the demand model as well. The difference uh, approach between that demand model and this one is that was a massive model generated a trip based with a trip based approach. So origin destination matrix, which means disconnected trips. This project is looking at activity-based model with an activity-based approach. So when you uh, you, mo you model the door-to-door -door, door -door travel patterns of each user, and you can't drop any activities. So if you get out from home without your car, you need to be able to save that person till the moment that they, uh, they exit the model, the moment that they come back home. So it is a, a different approach. Um, and this is an approach which is, uh, has been developed to support integration of multimodal public transport uh, and mobility as a service. So it's a slightly different approach. Ah, Collins is here. A lot of bruising. Collins. <laughs> and background noise. Sorry, guys, but at least you had the possibility to, to, to be at the event. We had more than 60 attendees today. Uh, it's almost 12 o'clock. Um, so if you want to speak, speak it now. Do you want to write something in the Q&A? I don't have any questions left. Yeah, um, if, if anyone else, if anyone else have any other questions. No. 
if you want to be in touch with us and do having a meeting and going to the nitty gritty of the actual model or very any, any other stage of the model, you can contact uh, either me or Mila using our emails, which I have somewhere here. Here. You can contact us uh, if you have any further question or if you'd like a follow-up meeting on the demand project. Um, we got, uh, I think we reached the end, we got five minutes before 12. Um, so if you don't have any other question, we can close the yeah. meeting. Yeah, I think if there is no other question, we can wrap this up. So there are no no more Q and A. Anik has reminded me if you would like to leave a message um, in the chat box, we got the feedback. It is extremely important uh, for us to learn how to improve in how we uh, we we conduct the webinars and if you would like to see something different. So you can uh, fill in the survey monkey and the link is on the webinar. Um, and that will be used confidentially by, by the Connected in Places Catapult. I don't think... Uh, the question got... about sharing slides. I think slides and the recording of this will be shared. Yes, the recording yeah. I think will be shared on YouTube. Um, yeah. So if you left your email, we will be able to send you the link for the recording. Uh, the slides, uh, I don't think, are going to be shared uh, because we are going to use them. Uh, the material we are we are going to share published papers and executive summary uh, for the demand project as well. And if you would like to have more information, um, I need to. We can uh, we can contact us and we can share the papers that we have produced with you. <laughs>